Oh, I guess it's uh, about time to start. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Hans de Goede and I would like to talk to you uh, today about SPICE, the virtual desktop uh, remote display protocol from Red Hat and about USB redirection for virtual machines. And uh, well, let's get started. So these uh, are the topics which I will uh, try to discuss today. First, a little bit about SPICE. What is SPICE exactly? What are the advantages? Uh, something about para-virtual graphics, which is sort of the, the core piece of SPICE. And then uh, onto USB redirection. So what is SPICE? Uh, SPICE is an open remote computing virtual desktop interface protocol. Uh, VDI is sort of a new marketing trend for taking desktops and use, uh, putting them onto data centers as uh, virtual machines so that people have their desktop running inside the data center so that you can really easy, if you get a new employee at a company, uh, the sysadmin can just uh, clone, a, clone an instance of the virtual machine for the sales department, assuming they have their own special virtual machine or for whatever department the new employee is and they, they can be up and running in a couple of minutes. They just have a thin client on their desktop, on their physical desktop, and they can connect to their virtual desktop inside the data center. Uh, that is VDI. Uh, there are, uh, this is currently something which a number of companies are looking at using to make the total cost of ownership of their desktop deployments lower. And uh, a lot of that is being done using RDP, the remote desktop protocol from uh, Microsoft. Uh, we now also have, a, have an open source alternative, which is, uh, L there is an LGPL implementation for it. There is open documentation for it, although uh, I'm afraid that currently the status is that where the documentation and the implementation disagree. The implementation is right, <laughs> which I admit is not how it should be, but uh, it is an open reference implementation and since it's LGPL licensed, you can embed it in pretty much anything as long as your legal department isn't too paranoid. <laughs> it is LGPL version two, by the way, because some people yeah. dislike version three. Uh, as I said before, the, the key the most important point about SPICE is that it does remote display through what I call para-virtual graphics. More on that later. Uh, SPICE internally uses what we call channels. It has a number of channels. It has a channel for uh, the display, of course, or for multiple displays. You can have more than one monitor with SPICE, which is really nice. It has a channel for smart card support. We have uh, a virtualized smart card support so that you can, for example, uh, use a smart card to build a VPN connection then use that same smart card to log in to the web interface which gives you access to your virtual machine. And then through that web interface launch your virtual machine viewer and use the same smart card inside your virtual machine. So there's a sort of a proxy in there which makes it possible that you can use the smart cards at multiple places at the same time. Which is important because if your VPN is running over your smart card and you were to uh, take the smart card reader away from the client operating system and redirect it with USB redirection to your guest, then your VPN connection would drop because your smart card is no longer available to your client. Uh, so that's a really nice trick which we can do. Uh, we do USB redirection nowadays, which is pretty new. It's, uh, it's available in Fedora 16, which is about to be released in uh, 10 days or something. Uh, that's the first distribution which has it. It's also available in, in our Git trees, of course. And uh, it allows us to add a number of future extensions because we can just add new channel types like we have done for the smart card and USB redirection. So what are the advantages of SPICE? Uh, SPICE is a display protocol which is optimized for low bandwidth usage because of course if you want to have 100 people using remote desktops over your corporate network, you don't want every desktop to use too much bandwidth. And uh, it's also uh, optimized for host side CPU usage. That is on the, on the host, so in the data center, it tries to use as little CPU as possible because most thin clients nowadays are pretty powerful so you can just let all the display rendering be done there. As long as you are able to intercept drawing commands at the rendering level and just pass them through over the network as drawing commands and not as already rendered images. And there is some special code in there to handle video streams and do smart things with it, like uh, using lossy compression for video streams. Normally, of course, when you do desktop virtualization, you don't want to do lossy compression. You don't want to have your pretty anti-aliased rendered fonts in your text editor become fuzzy JPEG images. Your end user won't like that. 
So we have some special heuristics to detect if something is a video stream and then we do do lossy compression. Uh, we also have an, an agent channel. The agent channel has uh, two uh, big advantages. Uh, it is using this requires installing a special agent inside the guest. Uh, it allows you first of all to use a power, what we call a power virtual mouse. Uh, so what we do is we let the mouse cursor actually be drawn by the client. So we just use the client's native windowing system to draw the mouse cursor. So you have zero mouse lag. Normally if you have a remote display connection, you move your mouse and then later you will see the mouse move inside the virtual machine. That's not a really nice experience. Uh, because we emulate a graphical card inside the machine, we can just intercept, we can emulate a hardware cursor. So we tell the guest OS that we have a hardware cursor and the guest OS will tell us, you need to draw your cursor now as an hourglass or as a normal cursor or as a resizing cursor to resize a window. Uh, we intercept those and we tell the client you need to draw the cursor like this. So if you move your, your mouse over a, a place on your screen which will change the cursor from a normal cursor to a resize cursor, the actual changing of the cursor may lag, but the mouse position won't lag and mouse click events, etc. also will always come in at the place where they are. And of course the agent allows us to do copy paste between a VM and the client or if you're viewing two v VMs from the same client between two v virtual machines. So what is this power virtual graphics? Um, it looks something like, like this. Inside the guest OS, we have an application which usually thinks in terms of drawing stuff. It will draw a rectangle, it will render some text. <coughs> Those go to some layer inside the guest OS, usually GDI or X Windows, depending on your guest operating system. And uh, then they go to a display driver which sends it off to the hardware. We have a special virtual graphics card which we call the QXL device. And there is a driver there and that driver will intercept the drawing commands basically from the GDI or X layer and put them in a ring buffer. There's a ring buffer and uh, that's shared memory so that we don't get a lot of task switches between the guest and the hypervisor. And then there's also some mechanism to let the other side know that uh, items in the ring buffer are there to be rendered or that they're free and that the ring buffer space can be reused. Then inside QMU, our hyper hypervisor, we, uh, we have this QXL device code which lives inside QMU itself and we have, li we have libspice or what we call the spice server which takes commands from the ring buffer and it creates a display tree out of those commands. This means that if you have a low bandwidth connection to your client that uh, the way how it works is that the client will let the SPICE server know when uh, it's done rendering a frame. And then the SPICE server will look in the display tree and it will see all the rendering commands. And if a number of rendering commands together completely cover a previous comment, all those commands get removed from the rendering tree. So we flatten the tree before we send it over to save bandwidth. It's even possible if we see that the display tree just has grown very large that we do the rendering on the host after all, and then we just send an entire image of the entire frame. We also do that when a client first connects. Then we just take whatever is in the display tree and we flatten it to an image and we empty the display tree to that single image. We need to do that anyway every now and then, otherwise the display tree would, could grow uh, unlimited. If there's one area of the window which never gets up, of the entire screen which never gets updated, the display tree would grow unlimited. So we, every now and then we need to flatten it on the host to uh, keep the size of the display tree limited. Maybe before I move on, uh, are there any questions about this specific part while I'm at the sheet? What's the difference between X? Because X already has uh, the division between host and client. Yes, but X doesn't work with Windows Guest. If you're purely targeting Linux, then X, especially with some of the, the X protocol compressors, the X protocol is really inefficient. It has a number of round trips in there which really are not necessary. But there are X protocol compressors which take those round trips away, which save a number of statings which normally get queried again and again from the server on the client side. Uh, then X is pr probably for Linux use a pretty good cho choice for something like remote uh, desktops. But um, we can do both. And then you have a single infrastructure for both. So, any more questions at this specific? Okay. So, what will the future of Spice bring, or what we hope it will bring, and we hope we will be able to implement? Uh, we would like to make it easier to use devices on the client inside the guest. 
Uh, with USB redirection for a large number of devices, you can use them inside the guest directly from the client. But it's sort of inconvenient that, uh, for example, if you have a USB stock mass storage device, a USB stick or, or a hard disk, that uh, as soon as you redirect it to the client, it's no longer available, or to the guest, it's no longer available inside the client. Your client OS will see if you redirect a USB device that it sort of gets unplugged from the client and then it gets picked up and transported to the guest. So if you want to copy a file to the disk and you have just redirected to your virtual machine, you first need to unredirect it so that it becomes available in your client again. And then when the file is on there, you need to re redirect it to your guest to make it pop up there again. Uh, so we want to do something better for storage, probably something based on some network file system like Samba or NFS or whatever. Uh, the trick with that is that if you start doing network tunneling over uh, a spice channel and you have a company which has really strict divisions with firewalls you sort of poke a hole in that so we need to be really careful with how we design this that the tunnel will not be a full-blown network tunnel that would be easy just a full-blown ip tunnel but that it will only be used for sending those specific file sharing packets and that nothing else can go through which is what we are currently thinking about how we can design that in a way that we can be absolutely sure that uh, there is no hole in there uh, something else which would be interesting is, is doing webcams as an actual specific channel instead of USB redirection, uh, both because it will allow the device to show up simultaneously on the guest and the client. Both will see the device, but only one will be able to stream from it. Uh, and also because if you see, uh, know that the traffic which you're transporting comes from a webcam, so it's video, you can do smart things like uh, MJ packets or drop frames if the connection isn't wide enough or things like that. Uh, something which is coming up in the really, really near future is multiple clients viewing one guest. We already have code for this. It's already uh, in Git. Currently, you need to set an environment variable to actually make it turn the code on because it still needs some, uh, some more debugging and testing. But it's already there. Uh, and what's also in the pipeline, which is being thinked about and is being designed and discussed a lot, is doing something for 3D acceleration. This won't allow you to play Quake <laughs> <laughs> over a GSM connection, sorry. <laughs> but um, we should be able to at least do 3D acceleration for some uh, things which don't require a high frame rate or don't have a lot of polygons. Why is this? This is a mistake. I think I did a copy and paste too much. <laughs> anyway, so let's take a, a look at Spice. I already took the liberty of starting up a virtual machine before I started. Uh, one thing which you'll notice here is that I have four windows. Uh, this virtual machine actually is configured for four monitors. <coughs> uh, if you actually have a machine with four monitors, you can go to full screen mode and each will show up in its correct place on the four monitors. Uh, that's sort of hard for me to do. Also, normally you would like, possibly you would like to have your monitors larger than 640 by 480, which these ones are. But then I would run out of space on the beamer, so. Did I make a typo? <coughs> Demonstration effect. One second while it starts up. So um, what you also see here is that it's almost as quick as just using native stuff. Then again, this is going over the loopback device, so <laughs> it <this laughs> might not be entirely fair. But I hope that you see that this is a nicer experience than what you're used to <coughs> using, for example, VNC. Uh, like I said before, we can do copy and paste. We even went further than doing copy and paste. Uh, for the, the Unix freaks along us, we implemented separate copy and paste buffers for the clipboard and the primary selection. So if you're doing copy and paste between a Linux client and a Linux guest, you can actually use both clipboards. And one can be owned by the guest and the other by the client or whatever you want. So I can select hands at local host and then do edit copy and then select only hands and then over here, start G-Edit. And if I press my 
middle button, I get only hands. And if I do control V, I get the other one. Of course, doing text copy and paste is sort of boring. So our copy and paste mechanism also supports uh, mime types. And we can also do uh, a print screen over here inside the virtual machine. And then I can say copy to clipboard inside my guest. And on my client, I can start GIMP. And I can paste. And I get my screenshot inside my client. Uh, we need to extend our list of MIME types to include things like RTF and HTML. That's actually pretty trivial. If something, someone likes this and he would also like to be able to copy and paste between two Office instances, for example, uh, uh, give us a call or rather an email on the list and uh, I can guide you in extending the MIME type list. This also works, by the way, from Linux to Windows and vice versa, at least for images and text because we, we have code in place to convert uh, Windows internal image format to PNG and over the wire we're always sending to PNG. So that pretty much is the demonstration of Spice. What do you have running on your uh, laptop right now. Everything. <laughs> yes, so you have KVM running with the guest OS in it? Yes. And you have a client running. Yes. The client is the one that implements the copy paste code, right? The client implements the client side of copy paste and inside the guest I have a pro process which is called the agent. Actually I have two processes. You'll see a Spice VD agent D, that's a, a daemon, which is system level. And of course, within Linux, you can do fast user switching, so you can have multiple users locked into different X sessions. Uh, and each session will have its own Spice VD agent daemon. And the, the, the agent ties into a console kit to know which session has the focus, and that one will get the copy-paste request. So the agent process implements the copy and paste side at the guest side, and the client implements the copy and paste side on the client side. Do you have the same guest also, no, not guest, um, tool that you run on your left also available for Windows? Yes. Actually, a Spice was mainly designed for Windows. And later on, uh, we, we, a Spice was originally part of uh, the technologies owned by a company called Kumranet, which Red Hat bought about two years ago. Uh, <coughs> Kumranet's main technology was KVM. But they also had Spice, and their, their business model was sort of that they would give KVM away for free and would sell Spice. But when we bought Kumarnet, we also open sourced Spice. And since they were trying to sell it, they were mostly targeting Windows virtual machines. So we actually, after we bought it, we did uh, uh, an X driver for the QXL device. There wasn't one when it was still owned by Kumarnet. And uh, the agent has been written by me less than a year ago. It wasn't there before, the Linux <coughs> agent. So in general, Windows support should be equal to or even better, although we're trying to fix that, than Windows support. Any more questions on this part before I go on? Yeah, so if you run Linux, you, you, if you use uh, GNOME 3, then you will run in fallback mode because of the missing acceleration. Yes, unless you, if you install Fedora Rawhide, yeah. Because there we have software rendering for the native that's mode the GNOME now. GNOME part, in fact, or that's on the GNOME level. Then. That's on the GNOME yeah. level, yes. Then you'll switch to software rendering, yeah. which m might even be the best solution for doing composite desktops on remote desktop protocol. Have you used uh, NX? NX is also a uh, remote <laughs> desktop uh, protocol, and it's also uh, reduced the number of roundups in X. That's what I was talking about before when I asked why not use X11. If you use X11 with NX, that's the X protocol compressor I was talking about, then uh, that's, that would work probably equally well for, for X desktops. I would like to say we do better, but I'm pretty sure, I'm hoping we're equally well. We still need to do some fine tuning in performance, especially at the Linux side, because the original product was mainly targeting uh, Windows. 
So, um, enough about spies in general. Let's look at uh, the also very interesting topic of USB redirection. Uh, most virtual machines can already do USB redirection. If you install VirtualBox or VMware, you can, and you, you're running, you're viewing the virtual machine on the host, you can usually redirect a USB device which is attached to the host inside the guest. Uh, but with spies, we, ha we don't have the viewer running on the host. We have the viewer running somewhere else. So we want to take a USB device which is attached to some random client machine, pick up all the USB traffic from it and tunnel it over the network inside the guest. And maybe we can also just skip the guest part and take a USB device and redirect it to another machine without using virtualization. That could also be an interesting use case. So what? I already sort of explained it. Um, make a USB device attached to a client machine uh, available uh, inside the guest while you're remote viewing it. So usu usually you, your client will be the one which takes care of picking up the USB device and tunneling it. That does not have to be the case. You can also have a standalone daemon which picks up a USB device and exports it over the network and then have your virtual machine connect to the standalone daemon. And why? Well, people may want to use USB devices on the client side inside the guest. People may, especially with a thin client solution, they actually expect that if they plug in a USB device in the thin client that it will just magically show up inside the guest. And of course, because we can. We're all geeks here, or at least most of us are, I guess. So uh, if we can do something, we will do it because it's fun. Um, Clients and server become very confusion when you start talking about this. Like I said before, on your client machine, you could start a little standalone daemon, which will pick up the USB device and make it available on the network. So then at the TCP level, you have a server running on your client machine. So which side of the USB connection is which uh, quickly becomes confusing, depending on, because if you let your Spice client do the redirection, then actually the USB the TCP client server is going in the other direction and if you use the standalone daemon. But still one side has the real USB device and one side makes it available inside a virtual machine. To make the confusion bigger, or hopefully to unconfuse, but it doesn't always work, I found out. I've made some definitions which I also use in the protocol description because this is an open protocol, there's a description of it. It's not yet in RFC format. I should probably put it in RFC format and actually submit it to the IETF. Uh, I use two definitions there. The USB guest is the site of the USB tunnel connection which is using the device which is being made available, just like guest is using the resources of a host in regular virtualization. And the other side is named the USB host, not to be confused with the USB host controller. Both sides will have a USB host controller. One will use a real USB host controller, and the other side will use a virtual USB host controller. So in retrospect, once I figured out that people started confusing USB host with USB host controller, <coughs> I should maybe have picked other names, but I wouldn't know what. So these are the definitions which I use. So how do we do it? Um, the basic idea is simple. We have an exported USB device, and we tunnel USB transfers from the real device to an emulated host controller for the VM inside the guest. This also means that the guest doesn't need any special support. It sees a regular UHCI or AHCI compliant controller. Any guest OS will work, which has drivers for those, which are all modern operating systems, because those are just the standard USB 1 and USB 2 controllers on every motherboard. And uh, it will see a virtual device get connected to its, it won't know it's virtual, to its virtual USB host controller. Um, how I've implemented this, I've written a cross-platform library which is implementing the USB host side. So if uh, the code for the standalone daemon for exporting a USB device is maybe 30 lines of C. Because it just sets up a TCP connection, hooks it up into the library, and the library talks to the real device and does everything for it. Uh, the library itself is a lot larger, but the idea behind having this as a library is that I can have a little standalone, small standalone daemon for testing, or maybe some people just want to use it standalone for whatever reason. I can integrate it into the Spice client. Maybe someone will integrate it into the VNC as a VNC extension, because VNC also allows protocol extensions. So 
most of the core which is taking a real USB device and tran translating the real transfers into the USB redirection protocol is all in a library. All that library needs is a couple of callbacks which make a bidirectional reliable communication pipe available to it. Uh, at the other side, I added a new USB device type, type QMU, already had USB emulations and emulated USB host controllers and an emulated USB tablet or other emulated USB mass storage devices. I added a new USB device type to QMU, which doesn't emulate a device, but it just takes the transfers from the USB redirection protocol and sends them to the virtual host controller and in the other direction again. Some of you may have heard about a project which is called USB IP. USB IP uh, does exactly the same as what I do and has been in existence before I started working on this. Uh, so this was also an, a question, of course, which I needed to ask myself. So I started investigating USB IP. USB IP uses a very low level pr protocol. It doesn't even think in USB transfers. It thinks really in USB packets and it shoves packets back and forth without any form of intelligence. Uh, the USB physical layer protocol requires you that even if you're streaming data only in one direction, like for example a webcam, which is streaming video data, you send an egg for each packet. So USB IP will send an egg for each packet. That's not really efficient use of your network bandwidth. And there are other issues with approaches like this. For example, if we're talking about something like a USB webcam, uh, it expects that you empty its buffers at a certain fixed rate. And if you don't, it will overrun its internal buffers and uh, you will lose data of your frame and your video will, will look horrible if it will work at all. Um, and this low level protocol makes it impossible to do tricks like latency hiding. Your network latency will cause you to not frequently enough get packets from your USB video device, which will make it overrun its internal buffer and you lose. So we need to do some tricks there and we need a smarter protocol for that. At the time I started looking at it, it was undocumented. Later, while I was working on this, someone else worked, worked on documenting the USB IP protocol, so it is implemented now. And the current implementation of USB IP requires using a kernel driver at both sides. It uses a kernel driver to pick up the real device and tunnel it over the network, and it uses a kernel driver creating a virtual host controller interface inside the guest or inside a regular running operating system on the other end. So it re would require a modification of the guest, while my solution doesn't require that. And it's on the other side, it would require installing a kernel driver instead of just talking to Linux's USBFS. We probably will require a kernel driver on the client side for Windows, for the Windows client. As I said before, latency and jitter are a problem. Uh, basically, some USB devices expect that they will get very low latency responses from the host controller. They can expect that because they have a physical cable which, according to the spec, can be no longer than 1.5 meters connecting them, uh, over which signals are traveling by the speed of light. Unfortunately, when we put a network connection in between, uh, we get a completely different order of latencies. So that's a big problem. Network latency is way too high. Not only is our latency too high, the latency over the network is not reliable. It won't be the same for every packet. There will be jitter. Some packets may come in quickly after each other. They may get even bundled together by a router or whatever. The problem is that if you use some categories of USB devices, mostly isochronous devices, you uh, will get stuttering sound with USB audio. You will get stuttering or non-functional video with webcams. If you have a keyboard or a mouse, which you connect through USB redirection instead of making them available as an input device on the client, uh, you may lose key presses or mouse events because internal buffers in the hardware will get overrun because of the add-on latency before their buffers get read. So the solution is that uh, the USB reader protocol introduces a concept called streams. The first packet sent for an isochronous connection, so an, a multimedia connection like an audio or video connection, will be seen as a start of stream command. From that point on, it is no longer the responsibility of the driver inside the guest to pull the device and get all the packets out quickly enough because that won't work because of the added network latency. But the client itself knows, oh, this is an isochronous packet, you probably just, uh, endpoint, you probably just want to keep reading it. And it will start doing that itself. <coughs> so locally at the client, 
which gets rid of the problem that the internal buffers of the device get overrun. Um, we need to know when we stop doing that. Luckily, isochronous settings use something called alt settings, isochronous endpoints, and when that is changed, we see that as a stop of stream. Because it must, uh, when a driver sets an alt setting, it also reserves bandwidth. So when it stops using the device, it should set the alt setting back to zero to give the reserve bandwidth free. So we can rely on that. It's a bit of a dirty trick, but it works. Um, what we also do is uh, the guest OS will expect packets to come in with fixed intervals, because that's what they do in reality. So we buffer on the receiving side of the stream, which is, in case of a video device, the, uh, uh, the guest OS, and we fill a, basically a, a FIFO, and we don't start actually giving the packets back. So normally when you start an isochronous stream, the device will take some time to start sending the first packets. We extend that time, and the time we, with which we extend it, we use it to fill a buffer so that we can hide the jitter in a way the network packets receive and the guest will see the packets coming in at fixed intervals because each time it expects a packet, we take one from the fi FIFO and we give it to it. So what does the future hold for my USB redirection work? Uh, some bug fixes, although it's so far surprisingly bug free, TM. <laughs> um, Libvirt and Vert Manager and Vert Viewer integration, that is partly underway already. Uh, a colleague of mine is working on that. Then comes the one which I'm, to be honest, not looking forward to, but which is a really important one to have, which is Windows client support. Currently, I can take a USB device and redirect it using the Linux client, but I need to be also do that with a Windows client, so a Windows machine which is viewing a virtual machine. Uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, the highest item on my to-do list at the moment. I still need to do some small polishing with the Linux support, and when I'm done with that, I'm going to dive into the Windows part. Mac OS X client actually looks a lot better doable than Windows because Mac OS X has a sane API for accessing USB devices from user space. Uh, also interesting would be uh, what USB IP was doing, a, a VHCI, so a virtual host controller interface driver for Linux. So that instead of having a emulated host controller inside a virtual machine, you could just use Linux running directly on native hardware and redirect the device directly into that by having an emulated host controller inside the kernel. And integration into VNC as an extension would be nice to have for people who prefer using VNC. Uh, that has question marks because uh, it would be nice to have. I'm willing to help people who want to implement it, but the chances that I'm going to do it myself are pretty low. So let's do a little demo of the USB redirection. I have over here, I have a webcam integrated in my, uh, my laptop, which has, uh, which has ISB, uh, USB ID of this one, 0C4563F8. So for starters, I'll just start a USB reader server, and I'll tell it that it needs to steal that device from my client OS and make it available to outside users. Then I'm uh, going to start up a virtual machine with some special command line options. Mainly this one. Over here I'm telling uh, QMU internally has an abstraction layer for bidirectional reliable data pipes which they call chartfs. Over here I'm first of all I'm, I'm telling it to make such a pipe that the pipe should be a TCP socket and that it should connect to local host and use port 4000. And it has an ID, each chart F has to have a unique ID of USB reader chart F1. Then I'm also telling it to create a USB reader USB device, virtual, and use chart F USB reader chart F1. I hope this will work. I have network again. I had some trouble looking up local host before. Now this is all looking good, so let's connect the client. Ah, I need another window for that. Uh, why isn't this working? Uh, I, I'm, I guess I'm asking a little bit much of the computer at the moment. Hmm. Let me see what's going to happen. 
Hmm. I think I need to shut down my other virtual machine first. Otherwise this is uh, not going to work. So one second please, or two. Okay, so there we are. Now let's connect to uh, the other virtual machine, which I already started. Yeah, that's not working. So if I do an LSB inside my virtual machine now, you will see the webcam of my laptop show up. And if I start a little webcam viewing application, it should hopefully work and won't suffer from the demonstration effect. See, there I am. And you can also see here at the bottom that it's actually running the full 30 frames per second. This is uncompressed video. It can go up to a quarter HD, a resolution at uh, full uh, at 30 frames per second. And that is completely saturating the USB 2 bus and it will still work. So it's uh, pretty reliable using uh, isochronous data streams, which is, uh, which is nice. I haven't actually gotten around to testing a uh, USB redirection of something with this intensity over the network. I have tested USB 1 webcams over the network, that works fine. Uh, but I didn't have a gigabit Ethernet switch at home. And testing 480 megabits uh, USB redirection over 100 megabit network is not going to fly. So I still need to test that. Yes, Deck. Move a little bit to the left and wave slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is some latency, yes. <laughs> That's partly because of the buffering I was talking about before. That unfortunately, that's sort of unavoidable. How long does it go on? Uh, you mean if the latency adds up, if it gets bigger over time? Or no, you see the, the image repeated. Because it was an image of an image of an image of an image. The recursion. Recursion. Mm -hmm. Cause of the behind you. Never mind. Oh, never mind. Lost that. Lost that. Lost that. Lost that. Ah, I didn't see it because Except of I see. I see. Physical resolution at the natural end of the same recursion. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, as, as this shows the standalone daemon, and uh, using the standalone daemon uh, uh, from a virtual machine, but as you saw, that was a rather static configuration. I needed to supply command line mm. arguments to QMU. I needed to sta start up a daemon at the, the client side, which happens to be the same machine over here, which is, uh, well, taking everything it into account, it's just not a really nice user experience. We want this to be dynamically unplugged, etc. Before I move on, you, you had a question, or? Yes, what happens if I insert a USB Ethernet device? And you, an USB Ethernet device? No. It I will get... the network access to my remote machine. So... Yes. Your virtual host administrator is going to... Yes. Well, ...fart me out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Actually, that has been taken into account. Uh, the protocol sends enough information on the initial connect message to identify that it's a USB Ethernet device. And the admin will be able to, this is yet to be implemented, but the protocol already has uh, it taken into account, to say only allow redirecting USB mass storage devices, or only allow redirecting a certain class, or only allow redirecting these five USB IDs. If you're really security conscious and you really, really want people to not be doing nasty stuff, you shouldn't be using USB redirection. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, what we will do is we'll give the possibility based on the initial device descriptors to allow this allow passing through a device. But if you've got a really nasty user who, who knows a bit about embedded hardware, he could use an embedded system to pretend to be a USB Ethernet device, fake the descriptors initially, then reset itself, come up with other descriptors. You can, I, I don't want to go into that red race. If you have a such high security aware uh, organization that that may be a problem, don't use USB redirection. 
But if you have, you have a slightly less security aware organization, but you would like to make it a lot harder for your users to do something like that, you can filter on device classes or USB IDs. Or you will be able to filter once that's implemented. <laughs> it is on the to-do list. <laughs> it's actually a good one. I should probably put it high on my to-do list because uh, it's an important one. I had sort of forgotten about it again. So what I want to show next is actually uh, the way uh, this is intended to be used. And this is normal. I always run QMU from GDB so that if it crashes, I can find out where it crashed. <coughs> this one can go away. Ah, this is another one which I... Uh, <coughs> So one issue which is still to be fixed, for which I have code at home, but it wasn't demonstrable yet, is uh, currently to get raw access to a USB device, Linux wants you to be super user, which isn't all that surprising because you're not supposed to be able to get raw access to hardware as a regular user. So I need to launch the client as root now. But I'm working on a, a, a little helper program, which will have root rights, which will tap into policy kit, and then you'll just get a nice dialogue that your special credentials are required. And depending on how policy kit is configured, either you can do enter normal user credentials or root credentials the first time you use USB redirection in a session. But I haven't that working yet at this laptop, so. Where did I put my backpack? <laughs> yeah, I just realized I, uh, I need a USB device to plug in. So, uh, this is again the same virtual machine, a Fedora 14 virtual machine in this mm -hmm. case. And if you look at the, uh, the options of the virtual machine viewer, you'll see an option over here called automatically redirect newly plugged in USB devices. Now let's see, it's checked already, so let's see if it works. There is some delay because of the additional latency, it takes longer to probe a USB device and there it is. And if I now plug it out again and I give uh, focus to my, uh, my desktop, so the VM viewer is still running but my desktop has to focus and I plug it in again, then it will just show up in my regular desktop. Because it triggers whether or not to auto redirect on having keyboard focus. And you can also plug in multiple devices, but I only have this one with me. Yeah, there are a number of internal devices in my laptop, but I can't unplug them to generate a plug event. So that's sort of tricky. Um, questions? What's the transfer speed? The transfer speed uh, depends on the protocol. For isochronous, as I've shown and explained, for storage, for storage, mass storage device. Uh, the problem with a mass storage device is that it's using the bulk transport model. And at the bulk transport model, uh, that gives data reliable, but no timing, has no timing constraints. So I basically, you'll get to pay the full latency price because I cannot do tricks because I won't know it will be a continuous data stream. I need to only send each packet as I get it. Uh, and because uh, it's, it's bulk protocol, uh, you can only send one packet after you have uh, got the egg back for the previous one, so you get to pay the full round trip latency price. And to make matters worse, uh, it's also SCSI. And SCSI, each protocol is actually two transfers, each command. First you do the command and then you Send a do a, sen a send status command. So uh, it sucks. <laughs> it will work. It will work fine to copy a one two megabyte file, but if you want to <coughs> transfer a couple of gigabytes of data, this is not the way to do it. <laughs> is there in the protocol any uh, protection against eavesdroppers and other malicious individuals like uh, Eve? Yes and no. 
because uh, the protocol itself is completely transport independent. It just requires a bidirectional reliable pipe. If you use SPICE, you can specify whether or not each channel should go over an SSL connection or a regular connection. If you use some other means, you could tunnel it over, a, a, over an SSH connection, for example, if you use the standalone daemon. Uh, it's not at the protocol level, but your transport is open to you to choose. So you can add all the security you want, or none of it. Okay. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Um, one of them is, uh, you said there was a buffer to make the, the uh, transport reliable and latency and jitter. Uh, we just noticed there was some delay, which is pretty obvious. Um, but how large is this buffer? Um, that can, com can be configured by the guest side. Okay, but what's the default, for example? Uh, Ballpark figure? Currently, it's hard coded, but the intention is to make the, make the default uh, depend on uh, how much data the device is sending, which we can get from a USB descriptor. Uh, this one is currently using uh, five uh, transfers, which each contain 32 packets, so five isochronous transfer. So that would be uh, something like 160 packets, which uh, but uh, USB 2 sends eight packets at a time. So that would make it 20 milliseconds. And the second one? Yes. If I may. Um, have you tested any uh, uh, security dongle devices by any chance? Uh, no. Oh, okay. For <laughs> example, the Aladdin devices? Or okay. I haven't, but there is very little reason why they shouldn't work. Which doesn't mean they will work, but... Okay, well, for <laughs> example, they don't work. Uh, they have some troubles with uh, the USB IP project, so that's why I'm bringing them oh, up. Okay, okay, interesting. I did hear someone trying it and having some troubles too. Uh, yeah, it I was can a verify bit that. <laughs> it was a bit weird. Uh, I would need to get one in my hands and look at what they're doing, and maybe they have some trickery in there to try to detect USB redirection. And it also depends on what you want to do with them, because we also have the smart card redirection support. Mm -hmm. So if they are, uh, if they can, if they're mostly used as a smart card, you can probably better use that, because can then you can still use it locally at your client cool. to sign while at the same time. For the little bit of uh, research I did, it usually HID devices, at least one we've had, so it's not not a smart card in that sense. Oh, okay, and okay. The, the primary yeah. use case is usually software protection, license protection. So oh, okay, I see, I see. Uh, you said that you're you're working on it. Are you working on this alone? Yes. Or do you have? Well, I, I'm part of the of Red Hat Spice team, but we each have our own responsibilities, and I'm currently pretty much flying solo on the whole USB redirection stuff. Okay. And another question. Uh, you said uh, you're a developer also for Windows. Yes. How do you develop for Windows? As, so I I as I explained before, the bulk of the code, which is doing the whole take a physical device and uh, uh, so translate it into uh, the USB reader protocol, is all contained in a single library so that I can reuse it for the standalone daemon and I can reuse it for the Spice client and it could be reused for a VNC extension. That library uses libusb to access the actual USB device. Mm -hmm. I also have done on quite a large number of libusb patches recently to, to squash some bugs and get some additional features added. Um, libusb also has support for accessing USB devices under Windows and under macOS. So I probably need to do some work on that but the plan is to use libusb, and for libusb there is a special Windows device driver. The biggest problem which I see with Windows is that there is no standard API to access uh, a, a USB device, at least no usable standard API, to access a USB device from user space in Windows. So, so if you want to use a USB device in Windows with libusb, what you need to do is you go into your device manager, you search the device, you select properties, you select update device driver, then it will say, do you want me to automatically find a newer version? You say, no, I know better than you. Then you point into a special device driver, which is made available by some developers who are working on libusb, and you make it use that device driver. And after that, you can use it in libusb, but you can no longer use it in Windows. Uh, the plan is to, to have a library which will automatically do the same things which the device manager does and which will uh, remove the 
Windows device specific driver, plug in the generic libUSB driver when you want to redirect and when you're done redirecting, undoes all that. How to program is program it is open. It is I have always learned that Windows is not open. You, you mean how to write a USB device driver for Windows? Yeah, yeah that's that's pretty much open. There's a lot of documentation on that. Uh, actual books written by Microsoft people. Uh, I had once a problem with a device that was uh, running Windows and uh, and I connected it to a virtual machine and then it got corrupted because the this treatment was uh, not right. Is, is this also, is it in the guest machine, is it also USB 2.0? Yes. Okay. It's uh, recently QMU, because of a colleague of mine, Gerd Hoffman, uh, and I solve also did quite a bit of work on that. We added support for USB 2 emulation, for so for the AHCI instead of the UHCI controller to QMU. So QMU can now emulate USB 2 devices. And uh, depending on what sort of device you plug in, the device will either get connected to QMU's UHCI or AHCI controller. And 3.0 is still not available. Uh, we are working on XHCI support, which is the 3.0 controller for, uh, for QMU. We would really like to have that because uh, it is very CPU intensive to emulate a UHCI or HHCI controller because the API between, as far as you can talk of an API, but the way you need to control the controller from a kernel level uh, is very hard to emulate because the controller basically runs standalone and your guest OS just needs to fill uh, a list with packets which it needs to send and it needs to make sure it stays ahead of while the controller is running. So there is very little intercommunication between the two of them. They just have a ring buffer where they are filling in different places. Which means that uh, in the emulation, you just every millisecond, you need to check what the guest put in there. You cannot work ahead and say work for 10 milliseconds because the guest may not have written that yet. So you need to interrupt your virtual machine a thousand times a second and throw it out of virtual mode and into hypervisor mode. And those are expensive task switches. XHCI is a lot better. That has a ring buffer with a so-called doorbell. So you can just put a number of commands, or also a lot of higher level commands in a ring buffer, and then you ring the doorbell, which basically causes the switch from guest to hypervisor. The hypervisor can read all the commands at once out of the ring buffer and ring back and say, I'm done. So XHCI will be a lot better, but will likely be stuck with UHCI and AHCI for a long, long time before all guests we want to support have XHCI support. And we first need to code up XHCI support, which is also a tiny little detail. More questions? No, okay, that's great. Then we have some time to, uh, oh, sorry. Last question. Uh, will it uh, drip into better enterprise than it sticks? It may. It may. <laughs> so somewhere around 6.6. Um, could be. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you all for your time and then uh, I'll make room for the next speaker.